Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on an important and an interesting topic, namely investor state dispute settlement reforms. My name is Gaurav Banerjee. I am the vice chairman of the UNCCI, which is one of your co-hosts. Uh, which is the Ancitral National Coordination Committee for India. Uh, your other co-host is the Jindal Global Law School. And I'd like to first start with heartiest congratulations to the OP Jindal Global University, because I have just come to know that yesterday it was ranked as India's number one private university in the QS World Rankings, and it's an amazing achievement. And I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Rajkumar, the Vice Chancellor, who's been with uh, Jindal since 2009. And of course, uh, Francis Julian, who uh, helped us put this uh, uh, webinar together. As I mentioned, uh, we, uh, I am part of UNCCI, uh, which is a National Coordination Committee of UNCITRA. And uh, we are engaged in capacity building regarding matters uh, connected to UNCITRA, uh, such as the present one, uh, namely reforms in ISTS. Um, as most of you will know, UNCITRA is the UN Commission on International Trade Law, which was established way back in 1966. But as many of you might not know, India was a founding member and we celebrated 50 years of UNCITRA in Delhi uh, with the UNCCI in 2016. But before I have the pleasure of introducing each of our stellar cast of speakers, I thought I'll just give a little bit of uh, background as to the importance of uh, reforms in ISDS and particularly a little bit about the India experience so that some of you will realize how relevant and contemporary, contemporary this particular topic is for us today. Uh, we really hadn't heard about ISDS in India. There was a dispute regarding Dabol, uh, which was settled. But then came 2011, and we had the famous or infamous white industries case, where uh, 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 an award was passed against the Republic of India. And the finding was that there was a violation of, of effective means because the Supreme Court had delayed matters by eight years. There was a lot of criticism of white um, Australia, uh, including an article by Mr. Nariman, who was incidentally the chairman of the UNCCI, Mr. Fali Nariman. And one of the questions there was as to the language of Article 4.5 uh, of the Indo-Kuwait BIT. And one of the questions that are, uh, which is current and will be discussed is how do we interpret uh, investment treaties, how do we ensure consistency, coherence, predictability, correctness of ISDS awards? And you will be hearing uh, about some suggested reforms and some views by our distinguished speakers on that aspect. So white industries is uh, obviously where one starts the discussion so far as India is concerned, but now we have more than 30 um, arbitration notices, a lot of pending cases, uh, we have cases arising out of cancellation of the 2G licenses. We have cases arising out of the 2012 tax amendments. Uh, and uh, some of these cases, we have Davis versus Antrix. And in some of these cases, we have had peculiar problems like parallel proceedings in Davis. For instance, there have already been two awards in two separate treaty arbitrations against India, as well as an ICC arbitration. So how do you deal with parallel proceedings? How do you ensure consistency? How do you uh, deal with your damages uh, with various different tribunals? Uh, these are issues, uh, India-centric, but also addressing, uh, these are issues which, which uh, pan the world. Um, we've had this problem also in video, uh, Videocon, uh, where, um, sorry, Vodafone, where uh, two treaties have been have been uh, triggered, one the Indo-Netherlands uh, and one the Indo-UK VIPA and parallel proceedings are going on. So, so some of the questions also relate to uh, the 
concerns regarding the decision makers, the arbitrators. India has had opportunities to, India has challenged successfully and unsuccessfully uh, arbitral appointments. Uh, we will hear something about this from um, our speakers, uh, the concept of double hatting, whether conflict of interest rules are sufficient to uh, deal with such issues. Uh, the result of all this is that at least from an Indian perspective, uh, the government has uh, terminated 54 odd um, BITs. It's introduced a new model BIT, but the reality is that we can't really throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to go down the path of reforms. The Ancitral Working Group 3 has uh, engaged in this in, in some detail, in structural and um, institutional reforms and, and various other reforms, which um, your speakers will then elucidate. Uh, so that's really the background. That's really the importance of this topic. And to really tell you more about this topic, I am delighted to introduce four uh, very, very distinguished speakers. And let me tell you a, a little about them. You'll probably be seeing uh, many of them on your screen. Uh, may I first introduce uh, Professor Dr. Maxi Scherer. She is um, uh, an international figure. She is a professor of law at uh, uh, Queen Mary in London. Many of you would be, have been or would be her students. She uh, holds the chair in International Arbitration Dispute Resolution and Energy Law. Uh, that's only one of her um, talents. She is a uh, uh, special counsel at Wilma Hale. Uh, she is qualified both in Paris and in, in England as a solicitor, uh, but much more importantly for this uh, discussion, she has sat as an arbitrator over um, in over a hundred commercial and invest, hundred, one hundred commercial and investor state arbitrations. So she really knows what she's talking about. She publishes uh, extensively. Uh, she has had academic appointments. I was going through this amazing around the globe, NYU, Georgetown, Pepperdine, you name it, Melbourne, Berlin, the Sorbonne, I mean, the, the list is endless. And uh, if, if I can conclude by saying uh, she is really one of the very best in the world in, in uh, commercial investment arbitration. So we are really privileged to have you here, Maxi. Um, our second speaker, and I'm not mentioning speakers in any particular order because this is going to be more of a fireside chat, is Dr. Dirk uh, Pulkowski, who is a senior legal counsel at the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. And uh, the PCA, as many of you know, is one of the oldest uh, arbitral institutions. It was set up uh, in 1899, I think, and it has 122 contracting parties. It is uh, administering over 160 uh, cases uh, in which I know for a fact that uh, the Republic of India is also uh, party to some of those cases which are being, um, shall we say, administered by the PCA. Uh, Dirk has a very uh, interesting uh, background. He has, he, uh, has a, a, a broad experience acting as a registrar he has obviously acted as an institutional secretary in many investor state arbitrations administered by the PCA. So he really has hands-on experience as to how to handle arbitrations. More, uh, more interestingly, he also uh, supports the PCA secretary general uh, when it comes to appointment and challenges to arbitrators. And uh, this is a phenomenon which is increasing dramatically where uh, there are almost as a matter of course, challenges to arbitrators. Uh, and that's an issue which uh, the uh, working group two is also discussing. How do you uh, deal with such situations? He has represented the PCA in various conventions. He, had, he was of course in Mauritius, uh, supervising uh, the PCA's Africa work. He has had a commercial background. He's fabulous academic uh, qualifications. He, uh, has a PhD, uh, summa cum laude. He uh, has an LLM from Yale and he's widely published and you will get a very different sort of perspective from Dirk and uh, welcome Dirk. We uh, then have uh, 
Professor Gudmundur Eriksson, who we can, uh, as it were, claim as one of our own. Um, he has had a, a storied career. He, uh, he is now the executive director of the uh, in, of International Studies at, at the Jindal Global Law School, and he advises the university as well. He initially worked with the UN. Uh, then he joined, uh, the, uh, he became a diplomat. He joined the Foreign Ministry of Iceland. He ended up uh, being an ambassador in, ambassador in Delhi. And we have very, very fond memories of, of his lavish hospitality. Uh, but that is by no means his only qualification. He has been a judge. He sat at ITLOS for six years, uh, which is the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. He, um, he's lectured in over 40 countries. He's got a civil engineering degree. I didn't know that. This is the first time I've, I've come across uh, that. He has an LLM from King's. He's, an, he, he's a fellow of King's. He, uh, sorry, he has an LLB from King's. He has an LLM from Columbia. And most importantly, for, for the purposes of this webinar, he has been participating uh, quite uh, ferociously in the Ancitral Working Group 3. So he really does know what's going on there. Uh, welcome, Professor uh, Erickson. Uh, the fourth speaker we have is uh, uh, Pramod Nair, um, who I've had the privilege of uh, knowing both as a friend and working uh, with uh, Pramod as well. He is uh, a child prodigy, if I can call that. He graduated the top of his class at the National Law School, which is a fabulous achievement. He went to Cambridge, did the LLM, got the Clive Parry Prize in international law and really hasn't looked back ever since. He is widely appointed as an arbitrator. He's done arbitrations as an arbitrator, as counsel, ICA, LCIA, PCA. He's currently um, representing the Republic of India in a, in a couple of cases which the government has won, which is um, very impressive. He, um, he spoke at the international law um, meet in the UN in 2015, where this entire story of ISDS reform started. And he's also been a member of the LCIA court uh, it, um, Hong Kong, um, IAC, MCIA, and uh, I don't know how he does it. He also finds the time to teach at his alma mater, the NLS, uh, and he teaches investment law and commercial law. So there you have uh, four very distinguished speakers. And we have, uh, as it were, the, the cherry on the cake because uh, our moderators, are equally distinguished and are experts in the field as well. So it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce both our moderators, uh, uh, Marik Polson, who you see on the screen, uh, is based in Bahrain and joins us from Bahrain. Uh, she uh, is part of a boutique firm, which um, is not only law, but a lot of global strategy, uh, diplomacy, cross-border litigation, uh, specializing in PILs, international arbitration, human rights. Uh, she also has an academic bent. She was earlier the director of the uh, University of Miami School of Law uh, International Arbitration Institute. She's a professor of international law. She, her core expertise, um, and I've now bought her book, I can say proudly, is uh, on the New York Convention, which is as all of you know, is the 1958 New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Awards. Um, she uh, is going to take over and conduct the session, but she, uh, she is also uh, joined in this by uh, the other uh, co-moderator, namely uh, George Bolton, just before I move on to Mr. Poton, I, I, I wanted to mention that Marik speaks five languages, so you need to be careful about what you say. Um, and uh, I wonder what those five languages are. Maybe I'll ask her later. George uh, Poton, who most of you in India know, is, is uh, somebody who 
all of us in the arbitration community in India know very well. He has, uh, he's also uh, studied at King's College London. He did his LLM. He represents, he's a legal consultant with the Ministry of External Affairs. He's been intimately involved in every aspect of the government's interaction in so far as investment treaty arbitration is concerned. I've also had the uh, privilege of working with him. He is, uh, he went, he was actively involved in the Ancitral Working Group. So we will obviously hear uh, something about that from him. He was also part, he's, he's interacted with the PCA. He's, he's otherwise an expert, he's been called uh, to give testimony before the Sri Krishna committee, which we uh, know made some recommendations. He's advised on a number of landmark cases, uh, some of which I've appeared on his side and some on the other side, and we won't mention those. He lectures at the Foreign Service Institute. And uh, this morning, when I tried to catch hold of him, he was involved in some treaty negotiations. So he's a man of many colors. So with that, may I now hand you over to Marik, who will now take over and conduct the session, Marik and George, in the order that they wish. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, welcome to our speakers, welcome to our students, and welcome to anybody who's listening today or who will be listening later on. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the reforms, the reforms within the Working Group 3 at Uncitral. And instead of having speeches today, this is going to be a live debate between the experts. And there's an expression in Dutch, so now you know the, the one language that I speak that most of us here don't. Um, in Dutch, we tend to say the best captains remain on the shore. And today, that is not the case. We've got the best ones here. So whatever you want to find out, I think today is the moment. And with that, I'm going to give the floor to George, who's going to give a brief introduction of Working Group 3. Thank you, Marik, and thank you to Mr. Banerjee for the wonderful uh, introduction to the topic. There's no one better than Mr. Banerjee in India to speak about India and investment treaty arbitration, who's watched it from close quarters, be it from the government, be it from the other side. Thank, thank you. And now coming to today's topic, just a brief on Ancestral. First, Ancestral, like Mr. Banerjee had already said, is the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which was set up in 1966 through a UN General Assembly uh, resolution. It was set up with a view to promote progressive harmonization and unification of, of the law of international trade. And India has, since its inception, been a member of UNCITRAL and has been actively participating in the work of UNCITRAL. Now coming to uh, Working Group 3, which uh, looks into ISDS reforms, just a history on how the subject came in. It was in 2015 at the commission session where Ancetral took note of the fact that the current system of ISDS posed a number of challenges and there were calls from various states for reforming the current system. In 2016, the commission heard various presentations on reforms to ISDS. It was during the same year that India hosted the International Law Week where we heard Mr. Pramod Nair represent India and spoke at the UN. Uh, and one of the topics there, which Mr. Pramod also spoke on, was reforms to ISDS. The same year, India had the privilege of hosting the uh, 50 years of Ancetral, which was hosted by UNCCI. And again, one of the topics there for discussion was reforms to ISDS. Move on from there, 2017 saw the 50th session of Ancetral. 50, uh, 50th session of Ancetral at Vienna. And at, it was at this session that the topic of ISDS reforms was allotted to Working Group 3. As such, Working Group 3 was entrusted with a broad mandate which would ensure that deliberations, while benefiting from the widest possible breadth of available expertise from all stakeholders, would be government-led. It's, it's important to note, note that this is a Ancetral is also represented by states and the decision that though we have academics, you have observers, you have many representations at Ancetral, this in, in, initiative would be government led. It is mentioned in para 264 of the report of the 50th commission. 
Now that Anshitra has allotted the topic to Working Group 3, it began work on the topic in November 2017, and the Working Group had decided to proceed in the following manner. The first step would be to identify and consider concerns regarding the investor state dispute settlement. Once these uh, concerns were identified, the next step would be to consider whether reform was de desirable in light of any of the identified concerns. And the third would be that if the working group were to conclude that reforms were desirable, then to develop relevant solutions to be recommended to the commission. For this, the working group uh, meets twice a year. And in its first three or four sessions, the working group had identified the various uh, various concerns which required reform, which require reforms. These concerns are broadly uh, this uh, fell into four categories. They are one uh, the first one concerns uh, pertaining to consistency, coherence, predictability, and correctness of arbitral awards. The second is concerns pertaining to arbitrators and decision makers. This includes what. Uh, we heard as double hatting and I call I would call it multiple hatting not just double hatting or even the lack of diversity. The third concern pertained to uh, uh, concerns regarding cause and duration of ISDS cases and the next concern which uh, was discussed at Ancestral was third party funding. Now working group three had also discussed some other concerns, which included calculation of damages, exhaustion of local remedies, counterclaims, participation by non-disputing parties. But it was uh, decided that these need not be specifically addressed under separate heads as they come broadly under one of the four broad categories of concerns mentioned. Now that concerns are identified, the discussions move to the possible solutions. The debate included various proposals, hybrid proposals of work plan that would guide the work of Ancestral. And the work options uh, were broadly fell under two broad categories. One is a structural reform, the other was incremental reform. Structural reforms refer to uh, creating a multilateral, includes creating a multilateral investment, a code, a investment code with an appellate body. And the other group which preferred work, uh, work to begin immediately on the current system in a step-by-step -step process. That is maybe prepare a draft code of conduct to address the multiple hatting or double hatting system or, and various other possible solutions, which I leave it to the experts to speak on. But this incremental reform refers to uh, reforming the current arbitral process under of ISDS. We have, we have all learned from the past and know what the problems are. So the key to resolving these problems is finding the right solution, which is acceptable to all parties. It is therefore important to have a wide range of solutions on the platter to be discussed, deliberated thoroughly, and uh, states should be provided with, the, with app options of a solution to choose from. And I'm sure Ancetral in this and with the discussions today, we would be guided better on what works best for investors, for states, to come up with a holistic approach. Thank you. Over to you, Marik. Thank you, George. So with that, we are going to start with the structural reforms. In our view, these are the most important because it's, it's a big debate within Working Group 3, but also very much without Working Group 3. I don't think a conference has passed without one speaker addressing either the Multilateral Investment Court, the MIC, or the Appellate Court, which we call the AC, not air conditioning. So with that, we're going to start with the Multilateral Investment Court. I think many of us are wondering what this court is, how it, what it's going to look like, how, you know, how we're going to appoint the adjudicators, and maybe those who have proposed the court still have some questions to answer who will say, well, you know, this is work in progress. We, we will see what the end result will look like. And with that, I want to give the floor to one of the people who has been involved with this from the very beginning, who has been in the room, in working group three, who is with the delegation, and who can explain to us, what is this MIC? And with that, I will give the floor to Gudmundur. 
Yes, well, well thank you, Mary. Um, well, I'm very pleased to start off this discussion about the um, proposal for a multilateral investment court. And I'm grateful to, to you, Gaurav, and George for your introductions, which put what I plan to say uh, in perspective. And, and uh, thank you, Gaurav, for your words of congratulations to Jindal and particularly to, to Raj Kumar. Um, I'm, of course, very proud to be working under his guidance uh, these past six, six years. <clears throat> um, I plan to make uh, five or six points. And uh, we, of course, others will follow to deal with the more detailed uh, aspects. And, in, and of course, we hope we'll be able to respond to questions from uh, other attendees. Well, uh, first, by way of disclaimer, um, I'm not here uh, as a representative of, of my country, but rather as an academic. And in fact, I'm leading a group at Jindal, which is preparing a, a white paper on this very topic for consideration by the Indian legal and the policy making communities. I hope my colleagues are, have joined us uh, this morning. Uh, and secondly, I should warn you all in advance, as you said, Marika, that I am a fervent uh, supporter of this concept of a permanent uh, court. In fact, I joined the answer trial process in, in 2017 precisely because of this, um, this vision. And I've become more and more convinced over the ensuing sessions that this is one of the most promising directions to deal with the, uh, the problems which have been set out uh, earlier by, by Gaurav. I like, by the way, your, Gaurav, your characterization of my participation as ferocious. Uh, in my previous careers, when I never had the chance to, uh, to act in that, in that matter. But in fact, uh, in my, my participation in the working group, I thought I would be able to make a, a contribution on the basis of the experience which you uh, set out, Gaurav, uh, as a judge in the, in, in the permanent court and then later an ad hoc judge in the same court. And, and finally, um, I, I, a five-member five arbitral tribunal dealing with an interstate uh, dispute. But perhaps even more importantly, on the basis of the work that I did in the preparation for the statute of the International Criminal Court, uh, which many have pointed out, provides many useful models for the work we're carrying on in the working group. Uh, thirdly, I'm very grateful for the guidance we have had from the European Union, uh, which has in a series of papers uh, laid out the advantages of the potential court. You will know that the European Union and the member states are, uh, are, are firm supporters of the proposal. And also the excellent papers which have been prepared by the UNCTAD Secretariat and others, including PCA and the ICSID Secretariat. And I, I, I hasten to uh, congratulate uh, uh, PCA through Dirk and the other colleagues for the quality of their work. And finally, the work of the Academic Forum, which was established um, uh, to um, to deal with this issue on the, on the broader scale. But fourthly, let me give a checklist to add to what has been mentioned by Gaurav uh, this morning um, of, of, the, uh, of the advantages of the proposal for the permanent court uh, and the, the, the version of the court, which I envisage and others uh, with me, um, incorporate a um, both first instant jurisdiction and uh, an appeals process. Now we'll be dealing with the appeals process separately after this first round. Um, and uh, the proposals that we're uh, uh, setting forth allow for um, acceptance of both the appeals and the first instance or just one or the other. Well, I, I, I would, uh, the proposal that we are making and I, say, I submit that we success, successfully address uh, include the following concerns. First, consistency, predictability, and correctness of decisions. Secondly, independence and impartiality of the arbitra arbitrators. Thirdly, the transparency of decisions. Fourthly, geographical and gender diversity of arbitrators. And finally, the cost and length of proceedings. Well, as my fifth point, I would point out some of the drawbacks which have been mentioned in the literature and in the deliberations of the working group. Foremost is the abandonment of the party appointment of arbitrators 
which is strikes at the very nature of the existing system of the IC, I, ISDS, and that in one words of one author, confer, quote, the legitimacy on the process and ensure the selection of individuals with experience, reputation, and competence. Moreover, it is feared by many that, and I quote, the best candidates, unquote, would be dissuaded by, and again, I quote, insufficient pecuniary incentives. Well, um, Um, well, you, you will see as we, as we discuss further, particularly from others who have may, have may, may have views other than my own, that quite issues of impartiality do arise. Um, now, but I want to point out in the beginning, as far as financial concerns, uh, <clears throat> as far as the financial concerns, which have been raised by many who make comparisons with other existing courts, um, the models that have been developed, I think the most viable models, um, envisage a uh, tribunal consisting of nine judges for the first instance and five for appeals with an annual cost of 10 million euros. So this is the perspective that we're, we're setting out. Now, finally, on my sixth uh, uh, point, in response to those who do not endorse a project of a permanent court, I point out, as I've done very often in the uh, working group, that we are not as proponents of the, of the permanent court, seeking to bring the parties kicking and screaming around to our point of view, those parties which don't agree with us. If they don't see the merits of the court, they can simply stay away. This is not like the case of the inter, inter, International Criminal Court to which reference has been made in this very connection, which has an impact even on non-states parties to its statute. And then I find finally, um, all the advocates of the, uh, of the court, the permanent court, are also working in good faith on solutions which are preferred by others, including those referred to in Garab's introdu introduction, and they will continue to do so. Well, this is what I wanted to say by way of introduction. I look forward to the uh, further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gudmundur. Um, so, so with that, I, um, you know, you have sort of broken down the, the idea of the court in, I think, two segments. One is the predictability, consistency, so the decisions. The other is the adjudicator. So in the current system, there are arbitrators, as you pointed out. There is this pillar of international arbitration, which I'm sure all our students know, is party autonomy. Party autonomy means many things. Party autonomy doesn't necessarily, is limited to, I get to appoint my arbitrator. That's not what that is. They get to appoint a, the party appointed arbitrator. Um, but I think the, the nuance is here that there's also the role that institutions currently play. So my question, the first one is, is to Dirk, when we look at the current appointment processes, party autonomy, the party appointments, et cetera, et cetera, list procedures, I want to, to hear from you, what is the current system? How do parties and institutions assist in the appointment of arbitrators? How do you, guarantee, protect, try to ensure that there's impartiality. And in your view, Dirk, if we would have a multilateral investment court, just for, for the, the, the novices uh, among us, how would the adjudicators be appointed? Wow, uh, these are many questions at the same time. So I'll do my best to tackle at least some of them adequately. Thank you very much, of course, to our hosts uh, uh, for uh, organizing this event for having me on uh, the panel and for the very generous words of welcome and introduction. And also thank you to Gudmundur for I think a very fair introduction of the UNTITRA Working Group 3 process. I must say just by uh, uh, way of disclaimer on my side, and I won't have to repeat that uh, for subsequent questions, that the PCA, while an active participant in Working Group 3, does not actually take any view as to the desirability of any particular reform options in this area of ISDS. We consider simply that it is the prerogative of states to decide uh, and select the dispute settlement mechanism that they consider as the most appropriate one. But to the extent that states consider new approaches in this area to be uh, desirable, the PCA stands ready to support such initiatives at the technical level, uh, both by helping design and implement any new mechanism that uh, may be decided. 
Now, I think um, the uh, mechanism of adjudicator selection and uh, the uh, ensuing question as to who will sit on a potential multilateral investment court obviously goes to the heart of the matter and different delegations in working group three have expressed rather different views at this stage as to how that body might be put together. I don't want to leap ahead of those discussions that we will need to have in working group three. Um, but conceptually, I think appointing uh, appointment mechanisms allocate authority between three groups of participants or actors. There are the treaty parties, there are the disputing parties, and there is potentially a role for neutral entities such as institutions. And there is not necessarily a binary choice to be made between pure party appointment based purely on party autonomy on the one hand and a purely political process uh, which solely relies by the, on the election of states as uh, uh, the uh, selection mechanism. On the other hand, there is a whole spectrum of options and uh, I think different options def uh, ine inevitably present different trade-offs. Um, so if you look at it, um, uh, if you look at the uh, mechanism on the one hand as one that will lead to the establishment of a small and permanent group of judges selected by the treaty parties, um, one may expect perhaps a more effective mechanism as far as the goal of promoting consistency of decisions over time is concerned. And one certainly would avoid, and I think that's a concern that was uh, uh, voiced repeatedly in working group three, the selection of arbitrators based on prior voting or track records in past cases in respect of particular issues. A larger group of adjudicators, in a way a more arbitration-like mechanism, might enhance geographic diversity uh, and uh, limit the influence of any one government in the on the composition of the court. It might depoliticize the appointment process and it might also allow the constitution of a tribunal with special skills and what I have in mind here in particular are language skills. In fact, at the PCA, we have uh, seen a growing number of proceedings held in languages other than English. And that includes all the UN languages, but also Portuguese, German, and Korean, as far as recent cases will, uh, are concerned. Now, I think a second question is, uh, whatever the composition of the court would be, um, subsequent question would be uh, how the specific division or chamber, as it were, that hears a case would be constituted, because there seems to be relative consensus that cases should not be heard by the full bench, but generally by a body of three arbitrators or judges. Would that occur with the help of a neutral institution with input from the disputing parties on the basis of certain diversity criteria that might be hardwired into the system? And in designing that mechanism in particular, I think, um, for constituting a division or a chamber out of a larger pool, arbitral practice may well prove very insightful. Um, and uh, I don't wanna to take too much time. Maybe we can come back to different uh, options for designing appointment mechanisms a little bit later. Um, but I just want to note uh, that the PC has just published a paper in support of Uncetral Working Group 3, which uh, sets out and uh, outlines essentially a number of different appointment mechanisms in addition to the standard default list procedure under the UNSA trial rules that we have seen in PCA arbitrations or in treaties uh, referring to the PCA. And I'm happy to, uh, to share a link to that paper on the Q&A uh, uh, box as well. Thank you, thank you, Dirk. Um, it, it's so good that, that you're part of this discussion because what my sense is a little bit when we look at these structural reforms is that we perhaps not appreciate how far we have come. When we look at the beginnings of the I, of ISDS, of arbitration, how it replaced national courts, how it has promoted foreign direct investment, and how many arbitrators, how, how large the pool is as compared to, let's say, 20 years ago. And I'm sure Muxi will agree with me. Um, one thing where we've really made progress is in the area of diversity. And I think that what is really important to note is 
we talk about diversity. Diversity is incredibly important because this is a dispute resolution mechanism between investors and states around the world. So the adjudicator should be a reflection of that, that scenario. Now, Maxi, I actually received a book here in Bahrain with profiles of leading arbitration specialists and arbitrators, and, and you were in that book, and um, along with uh, Albert-Jan Vandenberg, Bernard Nocho, et cetera. And the question asked to all these arbitrators was, so what is your view on diversity? And I believe you said, diversity is really important, but the most important thing is, is that the best or most suitable arbitrator is important, it is appointed in a given case, and that these arbitrators are, in a sense, excellent. So quality matters. I think that we've come a, a very far way, and, and most of the, let's say, diverse arbitrators um, are excellent arbitrators. You um, are a woman, and you've had 100 appointments. I'm sure there are many, many more to come. And in our community, you are known as one of the best. So I want to ask you a question about your views on diversity in the current system, are we getting there? And in that theme, I would like you to explain to the audience, what is double hatting? Garab already mentioned it. And is that a good thing for broadening the pool? Uh, should we need a ban? And if we need a ban, what do you think that ban should look like? Thanks a lot, Mariki. Let me first start, um, like others, to thank the co-hosts for putting together this wonderful webinar uh, and the organizers, as well as the very kind words of introductions. Um, so in terms of doubleheading, maybe let me just uh, take a step back and uh, explain what that is. I'm sure most people will know. It's not a technical term, so it's not something that is defined somewhere. What the way it is usually um, the way it is usually used is to say that a person, a lawyer, sits as arbitrator and acts as counsel at the same time in different um, cases. Um, however, uh, as I said, it's not a technical term. So, for instance, the uh, code of conduct, draft code of conduct, um, that was recently issued by Ixit and Yuncetral, I think in May. Um, uh, this year um, actually doesn't refer to double heading um, and uh, simply says it should be a limit on multiple roles. Um, and so I, I think George also mentioned earlier, we sh really shouldn't be calling it double heading, but potentially multi heading because there aren't not uh, only the roles as arbitrator um, and counsel, but also as secretary to the tribunal and experts and others. So why, why is it a problem? Why is um, this hatting double or multiple hatting a problem? Um, think about it that way. If you are sitting as an arbitrator in case A uh, and you render an award on a certain issue, say on definition of investment, um, and you act as counsel um, in a case B where that same issue on definition of investment also comes up. It might, of course, be tempting in case A to render an award in a certain direction so that you can use it in case B. Um, and even if it's not a conscious and probably unethical decision to do so, um, at least unconsciously, if you are as counsel pleading in case B that definition of investment should follow a certain I don't know, Cellini test, for instance, um, that unconsciously certainly influences the way you think about the definition of investment in case A. So that's why the argument goes a double heading um, is problematic. So what are the suggested solutions? Well, one at a minimal solution is um, a disclosure to disclose the various roles that an arbitrator has. Um, but frankly, the mere disclosure doesn't really address the issue that I've just outlined. So um, the bigger and more stringent um, solution would be to ban um, lawyers from having these um, multiple roles. The problem really here is one of scope. What does that mean? Does that mean in any sort of arbitration case, um, commercial and investment? Does it mean only in investment cases? Does it only mean in investment cases based on the same treaty? Um, does it only mean investment cases involving the same parties? So the scope of the ban, um, having multiple roles, the prohibition to have multiple roles is really a question. Um, the scope question also is, 
does it apply only to an individual lawyer so that one lawyer cannot sit as an arbitrator and work as counsel or as the group of lawyers where um, he or she belongs so that you would have law firms that are more specialized for arbitrator appointments and another one specialized for counsel. So all of these are quite tricky um, scope questions. And coming to Marika's point about diversity, um, one potential downside uh, for arbitrator, uh, sorry, for these uh, prohibitions of double bans is adverse effects on diversity. Um, if an arbitrator from a certain, say, ethnical background or a certain geographical location gets um, his or her first appointment, that person just cannot drop any other activity um, as counsel. Um, that's just not economically viable. Um, and therefore, uh, the UNCITRAL working group also has discussed whether there is a possibility to phase out or to have different sort of a phased solution so that maybe at the earlier stages of the career, uh, people might be combining those roles and later on um, the, it's imposed in a more stringent way. All of these are um, ongoing discussions. Let me just add one additional downside, potential downside, is that we do lose synergies. Um, we used to say uh, that sitting as an arbitrator makes you better counsel and um, being a counsel makes you better arbitrator. So if we separate those roles, we certainly um, lose the synergies. Um, but I personally, this is my own opinion, think that some form of regulation on the multiple roles that a person can take um, is certainly welcome, but I think uh, the devil lies in the detail here. Thank you. Thank you, Maxi. Um, that, that is so true. I think that instead of us talking about a double hatting ban or an absolute double hatting ban, whether that is sort of in, in the arbitration rules or in a code of conduct or in a treaty, um, let's just walk away from that and let's talk about regulating multi-hatting with um, a good faith lens. Because as you say, if we have some sort of absolute double-heading ban, however that is being established, we are going to lose so many diverse and excellent arbitrators. And, and with that, I think, George, there's a really interesting question in the Q&A, maybe you can share that with the speakers. Thank you, Marik. So this, this question is from Ish Chopra, where she speaks about diversity. She says, gender, racial, uh, apart from gender and racial diversity, but does ideological diversity also matter? Where does the ISDS regime stand in this regard? And promote, perhaps this question could be addressed to you, Though the, uh, I mean, uh, the, though Ish Chopra wants to address it to Mr. Banerjee, her, uh, the, her question is in furtherance to about do these, uh, what are your thoughts on arbitrators and Indian arbitrators and investment treaty arbitration? Are more arbitrators and councils from India preferable? Well, I think that there are two separate issues there. Uh, uh, let me take the second one first. I mean, I think uh, India's experience with um, investment treaty arbitrations uh, has not been a very long one so far. Uh, I think the first one which led to an award was the White Industries case, which was uh, less than um, eight years ago. Of course, there is now around 30 odd cases uh, and the, the cadre um, of arbitrators is probably still young. People are still specializing in this field and therefore it's probably going to be some time before India creates a pool of arbitrators who have a specialist uh, expertise in investment treaty arbitration. Uh, that said, I think uh, Fali Nariman uh, uh, is probably the most uh, experienced Indian arbitrator. Uh, he's acted in probably 15 plus investment treaty arbitration. So if there is a role model for young students, then he's probably the best one to look at. Now, as far as uh, the other issue is concerned, I think as far as um, 
uh, the, 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 the appointment process is concerned. I mean, I think that's probably one of the most controversial topics um, in investment treaty arbitration. And I think the, the manner in which arbitrators are appointed is, is definitely a, a core issue. It's a key concern for not only states, but also investors. Uh, and I think the, the reason why there is some disquiet is there is disquiet with the system in which the, uh, the party appointment of arbitrators is actually being operated. Uh, but then party appointment of arbitrators has been around for decades in commercial arbitration. Why is it so controversial in investment treaty arbitration cases? Uh, I think the reason for that is that certain arbitrators tend to be appointed only by investors and certain arbitrators are appointed only by states. And it is this practice of repeat appointments that has created the greatest disquiet. Uh, some arbitrators are characterized as pro-state or pro-investor uh, based on repeat appointments by one party or the other. So uh, the question was about uh, the ideology of the arbitrator. So if you uh, are a state or a lawyer for a state, you would look to appoint somebody who has a public international law background, who has a, a pro-state or somebody who's uh, served as a, a lawyer in the uh, international legal department of a state. On the other hand, if you are representing an investor, you would typically prefer somebody who has a commercial arbitration background, who doesn't really look at uh, public international law um, uh, as a limiting factor. Uh, they would probably look at certain expressions, like for example, the fair and equitable treatment standard, uh, not as a principle that is anchored in customary international law, but as a freestanding standard that can be interpreted and molded by the arbitrators uh, in, in relation to the facts of a particular case. Uh, just to give you an example of how this proves to be controversial, I mean, and I, the point that I made earlier was that the concern with respect to appointment of arbitrators is a concern not only for states, but also for investors. Uh, just last week, there was a very interesting decision, uh, a decision made in a case between a British investor called Petro Celtic Holdings and Egypt. The investor challenged an eminent French arbitrator who was appointed by the state. And the basis of the challenge was that the arbitrator had accepted five previous appointments from the same state, that's Egypt, in investment disputes in the past 15 years. Uh, of course, it passed the IBA test because the IBA test is uh, appointments from the same entity over a three year period. Uh, the period here was 15 years. But then repeat appointments of the same arbitrator by the same state in this case was termed as being consistent with a broader context or a pattern of repeat appointments by states in general to the virtual exclusion of appointments by investors. So the investor in this case, Petro Celtic, referred to information on the ICSID website, which recorded this French arbitrator as having been appointed by states 84 times and compared this with the fact that the arbitrator received virtually no investor appointments. And according to the investor, this pattern of repeat appointments by states implied that the arbitrator had a pro-state bias and her appointment was challenged on this basis. The, the challenge was, of course, ultimately rejected by the other two arbitrators, but the, the reasoning in some ways is not entirely reassuring and probably also reflected some unease on the part of the tribunal. The, the other two arbitrators held that it didn't follow that just because the arbitrator was appointed by the state on numerous occasions, uh, the person would have a pro-state bias any more than numerous appointments by investors would imply a pro-claimant bias. Uh, I think that reasoning is a bit strange because repeat appointments of one set of arbitrators exclusively by states and another set of arbitrators exclusively by investors are both problematic. And one problem does not cease to exist because it is counterbalanced by another problem. And according to the two arbitrators who rejected the challenge, in an ideal world, ISDS would be enhanced if arbitrators move freely from state appointments to claimant appointments to chairing arbitral tribunals with equal felicity. But this does not reflect the investor state world as it is. And therefore, in many ways, the attempt uh, of states and others in working group three is to move towards that ideal world where we don't have arbitrators who have a particular predisposition or are perceived to have a predisposition to decide issues in a particular way. Pramod, thank you. I'm processing this 80, 84 times. 
there are indeed these situations. I have referred to them in the context of actually international commercial arbitration as the wild, wild west of arbitration. And I do think that there's a lot to learn from what happens in international commercial arbitration. Many of you, I'm sure, including Maxi, sit as arbitrator in international commercial arbitration cases, ISDS cases, et cetera. And we once did an event in Miami, which was interesting because the, the panel was a group of people from the ICC, lawyers, and judges. And so I was sharing all these, these wild, wild west stories as you know, some of the stories that you just shared from Odd. And actually this is one of what the judges said. He said, we are going to assume that those stories are the exception we're going to assume that, that and this is obviously commercial arbitration is different parties opt for arbitration. In this case, the contracting states offer ISDS to investors. Um, but he also said, and, and that was interesting, he was talking to arbitrators in the audience and questions as to how do you behave as an arbitrator? It's wrong to always take repeat appointments. It's, it's, you have to cross over, you have to be fair, you have to be independent, you have to hold yourself accountable. And this judge said, as a judge, this is what's in our core. This is what we do as human beings. And if most of these are young arbitrators were sitting there just speechless, like, oh, I, I didn't think of that. Um, so this is a question about accountability and, and maybe more regulation. I, I don't know. I, I want to ask Muxi about accountability. But before I do that, um, th we're, we're having a, a long discussion about diversity, quality, accountability, repeat appointments within the current system. So Goodmunder, you, you've been listening to this. Um, as a, a proponent of the MIG, what is your reaction? I think you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. So, well, much of what we just heard about double hatting and the bias and so forth, these are all obviated by the establishment of a per permanent court. Um, for the reasons that, that Dirk was also mentioning. I, I, bearing in mind that we are at the, not at the final stage yet, but I fully envisage that the proposal which would emanate from um, the work of working group three will deal with this problem very, you know, very efficiently. Uh, then it just depends on how active that court would be to see how, how much that uh, system would expand into the the the, out, the, the um, arbitration outside the, the the court, which we expect to continue. Um, if I speak just about the question of geographical uh, diversity, there's absolutely no there's zero chance that a, a proposal will emanate from the working group, which is a UN body, which does not take adequate account of geographical dis, uh, dis equitable geographical distribution. So that that is a non-issue, but. Uh, and I'm happy to hear what you're saying, America, and, and of course the, <clears throat> the experience of Maxi, that you see an uh, improvement on the gender uh, e equality uh, situation. That is not to be expected as a matter of course uh, from the, any UN process. I mean, despite all the flowery proclamations, in, including in the General Assembly, the, the UN <clears throat> system is, is abysmal. So we have to, in, in fashioning the new court, be proactive, we can take the account, we can take the, um, the example of the ICC, uh, which has a, a, a structured a gender equality situation. By the way, that's the, the statute, it's the Rome statute itself does not specify the actual um, mod modality of that. That is left to the state's parties to the Rome statute. I think we should skip that intermediary stage and, and include uh, 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 robust, uh, I would even say ferocious, um, uh, provisions in the in the in the statute of the the permanent court itself. I, I've always uh, tried to avoid being so personal about this, but <clears throat> but in fact I, I I've been discussing this in very very many fora. I'm rather known for this. Um, uh, I have uh, I have three three daughters and a, and a daughter-in-law which are in this business, and uh, and I I would think it'd be a crying shame that if that, that people like me, uh, if you know what I mean, should continue to stand in the way. Of, um, of, of people like them and, and, and deserved advancement. So as I say, in conclusion, these problems uh, structurally set out will not be problems for the permanent court. 
And then what we're discussing, of course, uh, we have to deal with it in, in the system outside the court, and that we will all, all of us are prepared to work on that as well. Thank you, Gudmundur. Um, yes, I, I think all of us and, and all the stakeholders perhaps want the same thing, which is we want this, this dispute resolution mechanism for investors and states to work. We want it to be fair. And, and still, we also want all the actors to be a true reflection of, of, of what um, the world looks like, not just gender, but also regional, but also minorities. And that's where I look at the United States. Um, Mark, uh, Mark, Mark, sorry, I'm just mixing up the names. Maxi, would you want to react to the idea of, of having, I guess, permanent adjudicators and, and how, not only how would it, well, you've already talked about how it impacts diversity, but how can we make sure that one of, that most of the stellar arbitrators that are active today, including yourself, so this is maybe an, an unfair question, how can we make sure that those uh, arbitrators will continue to adjudicate these disputes? Uh, let me let me start by saying that I'm actually um, totally agnostic when it comes to the solution of a multilateral investment court or ad hoc tribunals. I think that is for the states as the stakeholders to decide. Um, and um, I think as we've rightly pointed out in the discussion so far, they might not exactly all make the same decision. So we are not going from one system um, to imposing another system. I think uh, uh, we uh, need to make sure that there is enough flexibility um, uh, in making those choices. Um, of course, when we have a permanent court uh, sitting uh, with X number of people with a certain term, um, it will be only uh, you know that number of people and, and not the broader pool of arbitrators. And we have excellent um, arbitrators. Um, and, and I think you, you mentioned accountability um, earlier. I, I always am a bit sort of puzzled with the word accountability because it's um, used in, in various contexts, contexts and, and, and not entirely clear what do we actually mean by accountability. I mean, who should we be accountable towards? Um, one is to say one is uh, accountable as an arbitrator towards the parties. Um, the other one is, and I think that is the real debate in, in ISDS, is the accountability towards the public um, as a whole. So being accountable in, uh, you know, being responsible and liable for your decisions. Um, uh, so what is important for that accountability, first and foremost, is uh, transparency and, and uh, publicity. And we've come a long way on those points with the uh, Mauritius Convention and the UNSA trial transparency rules, because simply, um, you know, if, if, um, if you see the arbitrator's work, if you see the proceedings, if you see the award, then you do see, um, you know, if someone is unprepared or falls asleep. Um, and that is how you can hold uh, that person accountable for the quality uh, of its work. You can also see the award, whether it's well reasoned and what the result is. So I think that that is um, the basic point on accountability. Um, uh, allowing amicus curiae, as some will say, also uh, uh, um, strengthens and guarantees more accountability so that um, uh, third parties can actually also uh, scrutinize and evaluate um, the tribunal's work. As a little footnote, um, I have conducted um, actually at the PCA, uh, recently an arbitration that was uh, fully transparent under the transparency rules. Um, uh, the experience as arbitrator, of course, is um, that you there is a lot done to ensure publicity, but uh, it, I don't necessarily think that it interests, it's so interesting to the public as a whole uh, to watch the YouTube video um, of the proceedings. My sense is it's more other lawyers or other arbitrators who might tune in as opposed to the civil society. Um, now, the more trickier the question is that of sanction or you know, how do you actually impose or what do you do if, if there is a problem with accountability in an ad hoc system as we have it now, you could say that's fairly simple. An arbitrator who's unprepared or a sleepy arbitrator or someone who writes bad awards um, is simply not appointed anymore. Um, 
in a permanent court system like the MIG, that accountability question is is more complicated um, because you probably look at one longer term uh, for these people um, to sit. Um, and there is, of course, a very fine balance. There is a good reason uh, why you would not want to just, you know, um, terminate a judge's mandate because or an adjudicator's mandate because you are unhappy um, with his or her work. And that is judicial independence, which is fundamental to the process. So that accountability question is actually, um, in my view, a, a fairly tricky one. And I think it's over uh, so often put in over simple terms. And in my view, it's actually much more multifaceted. Thank you. Thank you, Maxi. And this is really one such an important aspect of why we're doing these webinars. Sometimes we get the impression that um, the stakeholders are, are not fully informed. And, and one very important aspect is what you say. There are so many nuances to all these challenges, like accountability, double hatting, diversity, quality, etc. Um, now, time is flying. I, I would like to give George the floor to, to pick one question from the audience that we can give to our speakers before we go on to not so much the adjudicators, but the actual building or what the, the MIG would look like. Thank you, Marik. We have an interesting question relating to diversity from Anthony. He asks, while it's obvious that the debate on diversity has moved on from why to how, could any of the panelists give an example from their professional experience on how the positive effects of diversity on the adjudicative process of the arbitral tribunal? Just to add to his question, I have, an, I have something to add to his question is, would diversity in any way compromise the qualification or the quality of the process as such? How do we look at diversity without compromising on the system, be it in the arbitral appointments or even in a multilateral court? When you look at a diversity in terms of region, are we actually compromising on the uh, on the efficiency or on the quality? And how do we address that? Thank you. I saw Maxi's expression, so I think you have something think, to say, Maxi. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I, was, I, I think Maxi would be the right person to address this. I. I do feel quite strongly about this um, um, and not necessarily for the reason that I'm a woman, but because for the reason I do think um, that we're making mathematical errors when we do say um, this might reduce the quality um, of our panels. Um, I think it's a mathematical question if you cut out 50% um, of the participants, if you look at uh, gender diversity, or 95% of the world population, if you look at uh, ethnical diversity, I'm saying 95, it's a guess, obviously, um, that you would reduce the quality. Obviously, if you have a greater pool of candidates, uh, you get the better people because you have better choices. Um, and I have one very simple rule uh, that I apply for every single appointment I make, being as a, you know, choosing a speaker for a conference or an arbitral tribunal suggestion for a chair or anything. I put together a short list of candidates and that short list of candidates needs to be diverse. It needs to have a gender diversity, age diversity, ethnical diversity, geographical uh, diversity. That shortlist, and can be a long shortlist, from that shortlist, I then choose the best person. And here I couldn't care less of color of skin, gender, or anything. And by that sort of two-step process, you make sure that you don't exclude anyone from the list of candidates because of your own unconscious bias, but you also ensure that you get the best person for the job. Um, by then making a decision really that is entirely um, color, gender, diversity, uh, blind, so to speak. So that's, that's my two cents worth of, um, you know, practical tip for the audience. Well, I, I think, Maxi, I'm not going to even allow the other speakers to react because this was priceless and you just dropped the mic and it's so true. Um, I, I don't sit as arbitrator, it would really conflict with the work that I do with my firm, but I do get a lot of questions from men that I know who ask me, gosh, we need to appoint a chair or um, the, the claimant arbitrator or, or respondent. And I, I have repeatedly mentioned your name, Domitil, Nyusha, 
not because I like you or because you're amazing women, but you're absolutely excellent. And it's also, and this is very important when we give recommendations, our reputation is at stake as well. So we want to hear back from those people saying, wow, that person, she was really excellent. And that is exactly it. Um, I have taught in the United States for a decade and that is a very complex place to teach. It's really hard for students from other countries. And as some of the listeners know, I've had a lot of students from India, a um, lot of women, and they get turned down at, at job fairs. And some of them have ended up working at, at ICSID, working at law firms, helping arbitrators, and they are among, absolutely among my best students. So so diversity will also lead to, to excellence. Now, time is, is flying. This is a very interesting topic. It's definitely where I think the shoe pinches in this whole debate, but there were so many more questions. So before I move on to the appellate mechanism, I have one question I'm, I'm gonna give uh, Dirk the, the floor first and then over to Gudmundur about what is this, what would this, this make look like? Um, are we talking about a building? where would that building be or is it something virtual now in this pandemic more, many of us have gone virtual so so for the listeners what what should we um imagine when we talk about the mic dirk over to you hmm. well that's of course a, a very tough question at this stage because there really is no one blueprint for an international court instead if you look at the practice out there there really is a, a huge diversity of different arrangements. There are at one end of the spectrum bodies such as the Law of the Sea Tribunal, of which uh, Professor uh, Erickson was a distinguished member that fulfill all relevant functions through their own staff. There are hybrid models such as the United States, Iran United States Claims Tribunal, which do have a standing registry, but also rely on arbitration elements and an outside appointing authority. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are bodies that are really established under the umbrella of another international organization or institution and that use the support of that institution for their functioning. All of these are international courts and tribunals. Um, so where are we going to land? Well, I think that really is uh, the question that working group three will have to address. And as I see the discussion, all options that you mentioned at the beginning are in principle still on the table. There's of course a lot to be said in uh, respect of the investment arbitration system where we have detected a diversity deficit, perhaps to be thinking a little bit outside the box and not to be thinking of a brick and mortar building in a European or North American uh, uh, jurisdiction, but perhaps something that is a little bit more spread out, uh, democratic on a, a worldwide basis, so to speak, whether that's uh, then justly called a virtual court, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I, I would expect that uh, some creative thinking can take place. Similarly, in terms of the institutional setup of that uh, accord, I think governments essentially will have to make a choice at some point as to what trade-off works best in terms of costs, in terms of practicality, in terms of scalability. That's a word we've used quite, uh, heard quite a bit in working group three. Uh, initially, the court, if it uh, uh, comes into existence, may have rather few member states and few cases, but of course it needs to be scalable and ideally on a flexible basis. Um, so all of these options are potentially uh, interesting and we have models to look at, um, including as far as uh, uh, institutions that work under the umbrella of an existing institution, the uh, Tribunal for the Bank for International Settlements or the uh, Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission, which were organized under the auspices of the PCA. In fact, uh, if you uh, digress a little bit, um, I'll be brief. Uh, the history of investment arbitration itself is uh, in a way uh, or illustrates a range of different institutional possibilities. Uh, when the PCA was created, um, it was in 1899, as was mentioned earlier, it was set up initially for interstate arbitrations. And many of these early PCA arbitrations concerned investment disputes. We then had uh, the uh, mixed claims commissions in the 1920s and 1930s. In the 1930s, the PCA also organized for the first time arbitral proceedings 
involving a private individual and the government. So that procedural constellation is also quite old, 90 years old now. And in, in, in the recent past, we have done handled 250 ISDS cases, investor state arbitrations, as we know them today. So to the extent that states now wish to consider new approaches, um, there, there certainly is scope for continuing the evolution and the change within the system. One thing, and perhaps if you permit just a last remark, um, going very briefly back to the accountability point, uh, one thing to note is though that uh, you cannot simply assume that creating a court and leaving everything else as is will necessarily resolve the problems. Um, independence and impartiality, or sorry, independence and accountability are not absolute terms that exist on a scale, uh, but rather uh, they describe a spectrum of possibilities. Uh, mm -hmm. And the question really is in which way adjudicators are held independent or accountable in a particular system. Uh, I think uh, Maxi has described very well the accountability structure, so to speak, of commercial arbitration, which some say is not fit for investor state arbitration um, for the reasons pointed out by Gudmundur. Um, but if you look at permanent bodies and uh, uh, we see altogether different accountability mechanisms being established. Um, the UN internal uh, tribunals are very interesting in that regard because the UN in a very painful uh, reform process actually reformed precisely that aspect of its internal justice mechanism and um, established both external accountability mechanisms along the lines already mentioned, reporting uh, obligations towards the member states and so on, the power of the budget, of course, but these tools may be problematic um, if, you, if not used sparingly because they may impinge on judicial independence. Uh, so therefore, in the UN context, a number of internal accountability mechanisms were created to hold judges accountable within the secretariat and make sure essentially that they do what they're expected to do. And if they don't, that there is a uh, redress that is possible within the registry or within the secretariat system and an independent <clears throat> oversight body. So there's a lot to think about as we begin to, uh, I guess, consider design options for a MEC. Thank you so much, Dirk. My takeaway from, from your intervention is, um, instead of boring, borrowing something new, let's borrow something old because we can learn from our past to use it for the future. And, and why reinvent the wheel, wheel, right? I mean, there's it has been done. People have thought about this for a very, very long time. And as I said, the best captains are in this discussion and we need to pay attention. Um, the academic forum, um, as I think George said this, the working group three normally meets twice a year. We're in a lockdown and the UNCTRL secretariat, the leadership has proceeded to offering uh, webinars and they, arguably don't replace the official sessions, but they are absolutely there to inform the stakeholders and to inform delegations. And, and in that arena, members of the academic forum have actually um, made proposals for designs. And I have to be blunt, but I'm Dutch, so I can, that those presenters are actually not like you, Maxi, or Dirk, those who've actually been out there in the field. And the designs, were quite outlandish. It was from docking stations to framework wheels. And most of the delegates that I've been engaging with just sort of, you know, tuned out. And so what we need to do is borrow from the past, but also make it more accessible. And with that, um, Gudmundur, since you've been involved from the very beginning and, and you're the expert in the working group, um, what would you want to share with the audience as to what this court would look like? Just, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if Icelanders are more blunt than the Dutch, but. Um... I would, I would allow me to be make some personal comments. I'll just add three things to what you and uh, Dirk said. Both of you are spot, you're spot on. Um, first of all, as, as regards the state of negotiations, we've now, as uh, George was pointing out, reached the point of actually proposing solutions. So, but, but nonetheless, the actual designs uh, and proposals have not yet uh, gelled into a one set of proposals. I fully expect uh, the, the answer to our secretary I know is taking advantage of the, the lack of meetings, you might say, in preparing our future work even better than they've done in the past. 
and uh, they've, they've been asked to make um, certain uh, uh, um, documents on what we've already been discussing, but I also expect to see language on the design in the form of a draft uh, statute very, very closely. I fully expect that the group of, uh, say, 40 countries, which are the advocates of the proposal, will make their own contributions, so we'll get the ideas uh, quite, um, uh, quite soon. And I have to say that I don't think they will be outlandish, uh, but I hope they will be innovative. Um, and my second point is that, um, which we can relate to what we're, what we're doing today, uh, I just heard yesterday on a webinar that, that uh, arbitration is now taking place, at least the oral uh, presentation part, uh, online, and we will see, we'll, we'll hear in the next few weeks, I think, how successful that has been. I myself am, am very keen on, on allowing that to happen. Uh, I don't know how we would actually do that in, in the future court, um, as far as deliberations are concerned, but I certainly think oral proceedings could be uh, done online. Uh, but again, I have a certain prejudice, uh, which I know, uh, which I'm rather not well known for. I'm, I'm not so sure oral presentations are all that uh, necessary. Um, <clears throat> um, so we have yet to see what we can expect from this process. As I said, I, I don't expect outlandish, but nonetheless, I expect innovative. And I think we can say no more on this stage. Thank you. Um Time is flying really fast. I see a lot of questions from the audience. Um, what I want to do is this. I would like to give Pramod the floor to, to introduce a little bit the, the sort of the elements of the appellate mechanism uh, so that at least the audience knows what that is about. And then Maxi and, and Pramod, I will let you explain um, how the New York Convention would, would not apply for both decisions rendered by the MIC and the appellate court. So Pramod, if you could share with the audience what the appellate court or appellate mechanism um, would be? Uh, sure, uh, Marik. Uh, I think the, the appellate court mechanism um, that's been proposed and been discussed in the context of working group three is a milder version of structural reform. And it, it would be a less drastic measure. I, I would probably call it as a halfway house measure as compared to the establishment of a MIC. Uh, this would be because the, the first layer of decision making would be unchanged. The first tier tribunal will still be the tribunal constituted under the BIT. And all disputes arising under a BIT would be submitted at least in the first instance to an arbitral tribunal constituted under the BIT itself. It is only when a party is dissatisfied with the outcome or the decision rendered by a tribunal constituted under the BIT would the option of an appeal come in. And the, the reform option of having a standalone appellate body, well, of course, it could be part of the multilateral investment court. A multilateral investment court could be uh, envisaged as having two components, a first year tribunal and an appellate forum, but there could be a standalone uh, appellate mechanism. And the reform option is really aimed at rectifying errors in decisions of ISDS tribunals and ensuring the procedural and the substantive correctness of decisions. Uh, the most important function uh, would be to address one key concern that, that has been addressed, that has been raised by those uh, who are stakeholders in the system, that is the, the relative lack of consistency, coherence and predictability in ISDS decisions. Uh, of course, unlike the, the WTO agreements, for instance, which apply to all states, it's a uniform set of agreements, there's a great divergence in the content of BITs between different states. Whilst this divergence would make it difficult for an ISDS appellate body to achieve uh, full consistency in the same manner as the WTO appellate body, the ISDS appellate body could certainly develop a body of authoritative legal principles, which could transcend a single BIT, uh, lay down some very core um, principles which could have a much broader application. And I think in that way, it would probably usher in a much greater degree of consistency and coherence in, in decision making. There are a number of issues that have been discussed in relation to the, the design and the composition of the, uh, of the MIC, uh, which are also relevant in the context of the appellate mechanism. I, I don't uh, propose to discuss those in detail given the constraints of time, but let me just flag up a few important aspects of the debate. The first one in terms of the design would be the question that's been posed is should an appellate body have the power to review errors of fact or should its jurisdiction be limited to reviewing only errors of law? Uh, on the one hand, confining review to errors of law can result uh, uh, in quicker decision making by an appellate body, but it's probably likely that there will be a much greater satisfaction with the ultimate justice of the case if the remit of the appellate body is broader. 
uh, a second consideration in designing an appellate body would be to address the standard of review. Uh, should there be a de novo review or should the appellate mechanism accord some degree of deference to the finding of the arbitral tribunal? Uh, should the, st should the uh, standard of appeal be every error of law or fact that is capable of being corrected or should it be qualified and limited to manifest or serious errors of law or fact by the first tier tribunal? Should there be an additional threshold to be crossed in the sense that should any error result in a miscarriage of justice for the appellate body to interfere with the decision of the arbitral tribunal? And all these questions are being discussed currently in working group three. Uh, another set of questions is, for example, should only final awards be subject to appeal or ca can interim orders or procedural decisions say on challenges to an arbitrator also be subject to an appeal? Can you file an appeal at the stage of uh, a jurisdiction award or a um, award on liability, or should you await a decision on quantum as well before an appeal can be filed before the appellate body? Again, these are nitty gritties that need to be worked out. There are questions regarding the composition of the ISD as appellate body. Dirk has already dealt with it in the context of the MIC, so I wouldn't deal with it here. Uh, and then as you flagged up, Marik, there are questions relating to enforcement, and I'm sure that we'll probably be discussing that in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. So here's, again, sort of the theme of, of the reforms that these are all ideas, but we have to still find the ingredients, agree on the ingredients, and, and what is it going to look like? There are some notes, actually, by the UNSTOL Secretariat with some proposals. Um, for example, the appellate mechanism could replace national setting aside and annulment committees, or like you say, it's in the sort of the appeal, uh, de facto appeal on, on the merits, but there are many questions and many sort of aspects left unanswered. So this is work in progress. Um, there are many questions from the audience. So I would like to give the floor to George to pick some interesting questions. Thank you, Marik. Uh, since we spoke about uh, the reform so far, uh, we've been talking about the consistency. We've also been talking about accountability. So if I may put one question first to the panelists, perhaps. The question is, we already have a Mauritius Convention on, uh, in, uh, on transparency in ISDS, which in terms of the number of signatories has not really been successful. But we have seen states like India who've tried to use provisions of this in ongoing arbitrations or in its new model BIT have tried to incorporate almost entirely the Mauritius Conventions. Would a convention like this address questions related to consistency and accountability, the, con the Convention on Transparency. So let's, um, I'm gonna just pick a, pick one person. Let's go to Dirk, what do you think? Thanks, um, very briefly, I think it's, it's quite right that the uh, effect of the Mauritius Convention and uh, more generally the, the UNCTRA rules on transparency go far beyond the rather limited number of cases in which they apply directly. I think uh, we had already seen a push towards transparency on a semi-voluntary basis by tribunals and parties before uh, those transparency negotiations came underway, but really in recent years that has helped establish a baseline essentially as to what uh, modern or perhaps future ISDS might look like. Um, it is, uh, of course, difficult to, to uh, see whether, um, in terms of countability, the Mauritius Convention and transparency rules could be an adequate solution or how far they would take us in uh, achieving accountability through transparency if uh, the number of ratifications remains relatively low. Um, we will have to see how uh, the uh, Mauritius Convention will be integrated perhaps in the reform package that's on the table in Working Group 3. Uh, from what I can hear um, from interventions in uh, the room in Working Group 3, certainly the um, principles and rules of the Mauritius Convention and the transparency rules appear to be part of the, or to be seen as part of the larger reform package. So it may well be um, that uh, we can actually only evaluate the real effect of that convention in combination with certain other measures that may be taken. But that said, uh, personally, I think that uh, we have uh, 
seen a lot more transparency in uh, in recent years, in part due to the Mauritius Convention's indirect legitimizing effect for transparency measures. And uh, I, I do see it as a very positive development. It also helps, frankly, uh, us as an international organization explain what we do and what these cases are about, if we can actually point to uh, a website and to documents that are available online. I think the, the general um, uh, feeling is also among the arbitration community that uh, fears of the potentially negative effects of transparency were generally overstated. Um, the position rather seems to be the, a bit of disappointment that all that effort uh, that has gone into making videos available and putting documents out there has not led to greater interest and greater pickup uh, by the general public because in fact, um, many people will realize once they delve into it, that it's pretty dry and technical and lengthy stuff. Uh, but that said, it's very good that it's out there. And uh, in fact, if you have nothing to hide, you better show it. Thank you, Dirk. And I think this is what, what Mark says, things are, are already, very transparent. Um, as a professor, in, especially in the US, I think I have forced, I, I would say assigned, but forced many of my students to watch those hearings and, not, and then, you know, it had to be almost part of an exam. So they would actually do it. And then you're right. I mean, this is not the good life or suits for many people. This is just profoundly boring, um, but important for um, accountability and improving the system or finding other creative solutions. George, do you have any other questions? Yeah, Merrick, I have a question from Julia from Netherlands. This is uh, with regard to the advisory center. Perhaps if I can put it to Gudmundur or Dirk, as they've been part of the working group. The question is, the establishment of an advisory center has been recently discussed during the unsettled process. What is your view on the initiative? Do you think the beneficiaries of the center should be only states or also investors such as SMEs? This is the question from Yulia. And if I may just add on to it because of the recent questionnaire circulated by Ansutral, where do you think the advisory center should draw its line? To what extent do you see the function of the advisory center? Is it going to be beyond a reciprocity or is it going to go beyond capacity building? When it comes to defending states, you already have lawyers. When it comes to, come to appointment of arbitrators of, I mean, counsel, where do you see the advisory center's role in that? Gudmunda, if you would like to go first. Yes, well, I'm all for it, and uh, I see very little opposition, both an incremental and a structural change. Uh, and I think the widest possible scope is the best. So uh, I would say basically yes, yes to everything that was hinted at in, in the question. And by the way, I would see this being integrated into the permanent court. I mean, and while I'm uh, uh, on that point, by the way, uh, uh, Dirk said something which I wanted to react to that I don't expect the, the permanent court to be in the locations that we have of today. I, I hope that we could have, the, if we have a, well, we will have a, as I said, because we're not going to be doing, being out making outrageous proposals, we should have it in, in, the, in somewhere in the third world. And I fully expect that to happen. The, the physical court will not be uh, much as we like the Hague uh, and so forth. I don't think it will be there. I'm happy you say that, Gudmundur, because I think a lot of people really dislike The Hague and find it profoundly boring. Um, I'm happy that there was a question from a Dutch person. Um, so we're, we're always running out of time. Now, for the audience and all those who have uh, taken the effort to ask questions, he did not select these questions because they were the best. We're just running out of time. So one thing that we can do is we will make sure that we collect all these questions and we'll keep them. We have noticed that there's a lot of interest in, in these webinars and this topic. Uh, the speakers always run out of time. So what we could do is one time we'll do a webinar with all our speakers and we just do all the Q&As that, that everybody has. So. Um, George, I think we, we could park some questions for really at the end, but since there's one aspect that is incredibly important for the MIC and the AC, which is the enforcement of these decisions. The question is, does the New York Convention apply? And with that, I will go to Maxi first. 
Yes, so this really is, as you put it, the um, the question, the one million dollar or euros or rupee or whatever question. Um, I'm speaking under Mariki's um, authority because she really is the expert on under the New York Convention. So the question is, what will be the enforceability regime um, of a decision of a future permanent court or appellate um, body? Of course, today we have the exit convention for exit awards or the New York Convention for, for others. And the New York Convention, as you all know, um, ensures that we apply at least the same enforcement regime in its 163 um, uh, member states. Now, if we look at the convention itself, it's unclear whether it applies to the decisions of a future maker or, or pallet body in the sense that there is no definition of what is an award that falls under the New York Convention. We only have Article 1, Paragraph 2, who says that the term arbitral award, which I said is undefined, shall include not only awards made by permanent, as not only made by um, arbitrators appointed for each case, these are the ad hoc bodies that we have, but also those made by permanent arbitral bodies to which the parties have submitted. And so the question is, would the appellate body or the MIC be such a permanent arbitral body? And, and the emphasis here is on arbitral, um, because it becomes really a philosophical question almost, what is arbitration and would an appellate body or would a MIC still be arbitration? Um, some will say, and this depends, of course, uh, the final uh, architecture and um, regime that is applied for the MIC and for the appellate body, but uh, some will say um, that a structure where you cannot choose uh, the decision makers or um, where the uh, final decision is not binding because precisely subject to an uh, appeal, that that is not arbitration. Um, Others will say that, you know, choosing your decision maker or a final binding award are necessarily inherent characteristics of an arbitration. Um, and I think there is some force to that. If you look at what is going on at the moment, um, there are certainly um, a lot of cases where the arbitral tribunal is entirely appointed by an institution, I have said on many of those, um, and no one will question whether that tribunal will render an award. And you also have arbitral tribunals, um, the decision of which are subject to appeal, for instance, the International Court of uh, Sport in Lausanne, um, or just closer to home for me, uh, section 69 of the English Arbitration Act, which as a default, provides an appeal on points of law, which the parties typically opt out of, but you know, no one has ever suggested that such an award subject to 69 of the English Arbitration Act would not be an award. So I think um, there is at least an a possible argument to be made that the decisions are awards under the New York Convention. The problem though is that there is no certainty and that that question might be answered differently in different countries. And so having that uncertainty, which has been underlined in uh, the discussions in the working group three, and I, I can quote what they said, divergent interpretation and applications could subsist for a long time. That's a quote from the document. And that frankly would be a disaster. Uh, so that you have some decisions who would be uh, enforceable under the New York Convention and others not. Um, so one way around that, and I'm mindful of time and will be quick here, we could go on for two hours on this topic, um, is to say that, well, what, why don't we then, if we um, have a treaty that established the MIC or the appellate court, just um, provide um, that the decision is subject to the New York Convention or, or, or exit convention for that matter. And, and uh, some similar solutions have been tried by Europe in, in the um, uh, CETA um, and in the EU Vietnam FTA. The problem here, of course, is that it binds the contracting parties, but it does not bind third states. So um, again, we fall back to the uncertainty that I've described. If you think about enforcement um, in those third states. Now, um, that really is the crux of the matter and, and the one billion whatever rupee question. Absolutely. Um, 
as you say, uh, Maxi, this is a whole different debate. We're actually going to do a debate with this with this um, organization on the New York Convention, especially New York Convention in India, New York Convention in ISDS. So you need to come back. I am. I have obviously many many views on this, but I'll just keep them to myself for now. One thing, though, that a couple of um, I think leaders of the working group three, three and stakeholders have said, well, let's just turn it around. Whatever we're going to decide, whether it's a MIC next to PCA exit, whether it's an appellate mechanism, we want to make sure that however we create this, the New York Convention has to be applicable. So with this, I want to give the floor back to Gudmundur. What are you your views on this for the New York Convention? Well, I think that you've set out the views, both of you, and um, uh, I have a very good non-legal colleague who, who would call this a legal delicacy. And uh, the, I don't think we can, as the, 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 the quote you, from, you, you made from the report sets it out uh, very clearly. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm very optimistic to say that if the, the, the MIC uh, uh, statute is widely um, adopted, then this would be no problem. The state's parties will so de decide that it, it, within their own jurisdictions that New York uh, Convention would, would apply, or for that matter, some alternative mechanism. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm very optimistic that I think that a, a way will be found to deal with this because the, that relationship is very important. We also had a discussion on the relationship with ICSID and what about enforceability there. There we may, you may even have a, a better, even, even more of a delicacy, a legal delicacy. Uh, how can the parties they exit decide a, a, a procedure <clears throat> which de departs from the enforcement there? But as I said, these are things which I hope will sort themselves out in time. Yes, I could just continue, I guess, to play the devil's advocate. It, um, what I find very interesting, Gudmundur, is that um, along with Aubrey Vanderberg, who, who was my mentor, and, and obviously Pete Saunders who created the New York Convention, at some point we had some, I guess, intellectual academic fun with the New York Convention when Aubriane had to give a presentation. I believe it was at the uh, 50th anniversary of the New York Convention. So he created the Dublin draft, which because we taught in Miami, we adopted the Miami draft and ooh, let's just have a new treaty. And I happened to teach treaty interpretation. So I figured this is gonna be very complex, but Ancetrol kind of came back to us saying, well, it's going to be so complex just practically to replace the New York Convention. There's so many contracting states, as Muxi says, how would all those contracting states just transition to a new treaty? So that is going to be a real challenge to have 160 contracting states say, oh, we're just going to go to the MIG and say that the New York Convention applies in our territory. And I'm only saying this because that was the argument used by Ansutol. Call me blunt, but this is something that we need to take into account. However, one important question is this, this thing of party autonomy, which is a pillar of international arbitration, but also the New York Convention. So Dirk, given that you are the expert, the institutional expert, let's do a little bit of a hypothetical given that we're with students. Let's say that the PCA as a pointing authority um, in a given case will end up appointing all arbitrators. And then that award is going to be uh, presented for enforcement under the New York Convention. What, how would that, unfold in your personal view? Well, I guess I'm in the lucky position to be able to say that uh, we're really only in charge of these proceedings until the award is out and perhaps any interpretations and corrections are done. So whatever happens uh, before domestic courts and enforcement or set aside proceedings, um, no, but uh, joke aside, I actually uh, have a very limited grasp as to what happens to our PCA awards after we have rendered them because there's no obligation to report back to the PCA as to what the parties do with these uh, awards. We, we know sometimes either from public sources or because the parties approach us with, with requests for certified copies and so on. So I'm not sure I can um, say a whole lot about the views likely to be taken by enforcing courts. Um, one aspect I think to consider is um, if we have limited precedent in respect of permanent arbitral bodies, uh, sports was one area that was mentioned, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal led to some litigation um, uh, in which I understand uh, ultimately the position was confirmed that this was an international arbitral award. Um, so there's some things, some things to go by. The other uh, aspect perhaps to consider is um, that there 
uh, let me make two points. One, that we see a perhaps emerging trend, maybe that's or still a little too, too much, an overstatement at this point, but certainly indications that states are trying in their trying out in their treaty practice new approaches to appointment. And I'm thinking here of the new uh, Netherlands model BIT. Uh, in that model BIT, um, which was published, I think, a year ago, um, there is a provision that says that all members of the tribunal shall be appointed by the appointing authority. And in case the claimant chooses on such trial arbitration, the secretary general of the PCA shall be that appointing authority. Um, so clearly, states begin to address that question and take the view that they can have an investor state arbitration, as is still contemplated by that version of the model BIT, uh, while at the same time entrusting an institution to make all these appointments. Now, moving on to the second part of your question, the role of party autonomy, I think, again, the model BIT of the Netherlands is quite interesting, as it specifically requires the appointing authority, who will then appoint all three arbitrators, to thoroughly consult the parties, the disputing parties in this case. It also hardwires certain qualifications. In fact, it specifically uh, stresses that the appointing authority shall strive for gender and geographic diversity. These are almost uh, superior characteristics in the drafting design of that, of that BIT, but then also lists a number of other professional uh, qualifications that arbitrators need to possess, as does, in fact, the new India BIT, which also has a specific provision on that. So I think um, to come back perhaps to, to the theme we had uh, uh, addressed earlier, there is an attempt in these new generation model BITs to distribute the roles slightly differently as between treaty parties, who's now set out a number of very clear um, qualities they'd like to see uh, represented on the tribunal as a collegial body, the disputing parties who under the Dutch model BIT still have a degree of autonomy in influencing the composition of the tribunal and a neutral entity uh, in the Dutch model BIT, the exit secretary general and the PCA secretary general, depending on the choice of rules of procedure, who manage that process in a way uh, from a neutral vantage point and ensure thereby that the preferences of the treaty parties and the disputing parties are reconciled. I just, I just wrote a piece on the Dutch model BIT arguing how the New York Convention will not apply to that model. And as a Dutch person, I can tell you, I'm deeply ashamed of whom, whichever Dutch person drafted that text. I think it's absolutely horrible, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, so um, the New York Convention whole very interesting topic, but let's just bring it back home uh, to India. Um, George, I'm gonna give the floor to you so you can spar a bit with Pramod. Yes, so Pramod, the invariable topic, I mean, something inevitable when you discuss about enforcement and India, the word of one judgment. As you know, in India, enf uh, enforcement of arbitral award is co covered under the Indian Arbitration Act. The New York Convention is covered under that. The word of one judgment went on to say that the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act does not apply to investment treaty proceedings. So how do we look at enforcing investment treaty awards in India? On the contrary, we had an interesting judgment in the Kaitan case where it, reiterate, where it reiterated word of word, but at the same time, if you go into the judgment, it also the court also goes on to state that the state should respect and adhere to its treaty obligations. When the court did not allow an anti-arbitration injection, it mentioned that the state has to respect the treaty obligation. So does not, doesn't providing for arbitration in a treaty also imply that the outcome of the proceedings should be respected, which also includes the enforcement of the award. Talking about the Dutch treaty, perhaps the silver lining in the new Indian model BIT is that we have a provision which says or provides that any award under the investment treaty, under the treaty shall be treated as a commercial award under the New York Convention. But that's not the case in the 30 odd cases pending where courts have invariably said the Arbitration Conciliation Act is not applicable to investment treaty awards. Also, we have a commercial reservation under the New York Convention. 
to Pramod, and after Pramod, probably Marik, you can have the last word on the New York Convention. Pramod, I think you're on mute. Uh, thanks, George. This is the stage where Deja Vu takes over. We go back to uh, what we discussed around two or three weeks back. Uh, yes, I mean, I think the, the Vodafone decision is controversial for a number of reasons. And uh, like we discussed last time, I think the, the final word, of course, will be uh, when the matter goes before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will be called upon to decide the issue. But, but in terms of the, uh, the, the reasoning of the court, I mean, I, I would probably uh, view these as uh, not being part of the main judgment of the court. It's not the arbiter of the judgment. These are passing observations that were made by the court. And the observation of the court was that since bilateral investment treaties um, relate to sovereign guarantees and sovereign obligations undertaken by the Republic of India, uh, uh, these are not in that sense uh, commercial. Uh, it, it might have uh, probably been an interesting analysis if the court said that since these are matters of sovereign guarantees, these issues are not justiciable before the Indian courts. And then there's a line of case law to that extent where uh, states have immunity from suit and have immunity from enforcement. So to the extent that there is uh, an issue of sovereign immunity, then the courts are probably not equipped to deal with it, especially in respect of states which follow uh, the rule of absolute immunity that uh, states cannot be sued uh, in, or, or uh, arbitral awards uh, cannot be enforced against states by virtue of the immunity that states have in respect of immunity from enforcement. But that was not what the uh, court actually held. In fact, this was a case relating to an application filed by India. So there was, uh, even if there was sovereign immunity, there probably was a waiver of sovereign immunity because it was India which invoked the jurisdiction of the court to seek an anti-arbitration injunction from the Delhi High Court. Uh, and in any case, I think there is case law to suggest that the, the, the principle of international law that India has adopted is the principle of restrictive immunity and not absolute immunity. So uh, in the future, if there is a case either against India or a foreign state in, uh, by virtue of um, an arbitral award being sought to be enforced against uh, the assets of a foreign state located in India, the, the applicable principle that the Indian courts would apply would be the principle of restrictive immunity. Uh, and uh, we, we've discussed last time uh, the, the explanation to the ancestral model law, et cetera, uh, as, well as, well, as, uh, as well as the explanation to the New York Convention, the, commercial, the scope of the commercial reservation made by India. Uh, I think uh, an investment transaction is to many the very definition of a commercial transaction, it would probably be straining language a bit too much to say that a transaction relating to an in investment made in India would not be a commercial transaction uh, and therefore would not uh, fall within the scope of the commercial reservation. Uh, so for all these reasons, and also the most important uh, point that you made at the beginning, which was that India has a constitutional obligation to respect international treaties and uh, respect the decisions of international bodies. So if you look at uh, all these principles principles uh, together, then I think the, the conclusion that the Supreme Court may reach, and well, of course, there's a lot of crystal ball gazing here uh, to predict how the Supreme Court will decide. I think the, the eventual outcome, which I think would be consistent with India's constitutional principles, as well as international law obligations, would be that a BIT award would, of course, be enforceable in India, and the commercial reservation would not preclude that from happening. Good. Um, we have five minutes to go, which is amazing because most webinars are not even an hour and our webinars, two hours and we haven't covered most of it. So, um, George, you asked me to react on the New York Convention. Uh, I'm not going to. I have, I guess I talk too much. I have too much to say about, about that topic. So what I'm going to say is this look at this webinar and, and everything we just said about the New York Convention as kind of a trailer, you know, an interesting movie trailer for the actual uh, real th thing, which is the next webinar is going to be about the New York Convention. We will be talking about the treaty, the treaty in India, the commercial reservation, Article 1-2 and how that New York Convention would or would not apply for any of the structural reforms and, and what the next steps are. This treaty is now 60 years old. Um, there are, I think, between 2,000 and 3,000 decisions rendered worldwide. 
So either way, there is uh, unpredictability as we speak. And what is really wonderful about these webinars is that we're all reunited with Pramod and Ajay and, and all the people that ICA used to work with back in 2013 when we did a judicial dialogue on the New York Convention in Delhi with Fali Nariman, who, who held, gave a wonderful presentation where he said, international law perhaps has not achieved much, but it's good that it's there. And my concern is that with all these reforms, we do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We preserve what is good. We save the New York Convention, make sure that it continues to apply because at the end of the day, that is a treaty that originates from the UN. It's not the New York Convention, it's actually the United Nations uh, Convention on the Recognition uh, and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. So that is going to be next. Um, I'm hoping very much that our speakers today will, will join us again. Uh, Maxi, you called me one of the authorities on the New York Convention, but you are as well. And hopefully we are bringing in one of the, um, I'm not gonna say oldest, um, I guess most experienced authorities, uh, authority on the New York Convention. Um, and he is the mentee of the father of the New York Convention. He has learned from the master himself, Pete Saunders, who really drafted the text as we know it today in 1958, Aubrey Vandenberg, who has been the general editor, who has written the book, who has practiced and preached the New York Convention for most of his career, will join us at that webinar. And that is an occasion where we can really drill deep into that treaty. So what we're gonna do is this, we're gonna keep all these questions. Any other questions that you will have about today or about the New York Convention, I'm sure you can share that with the organizers because we just don't have enough time to discuss this or the incremental reforms. So that's it for today. I'm gonna to give the floor back to George and Gaurav to, to close this webinar. Thank you, Marik. And before we come to the end, I would like to thank Jindal Global Law School, Professor Raj Kumar and uh, Mr. Francis Julian for this opportunity and for organizing this wonderful webinar. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank our media partners, LiveLaw and Rashid for all their support. And the web, this intellectually stimulating webinar wouldn't have been possible without our speakers, the panelists from different jurisdictions. We've had the opportunity to hear to various proposals, various aspects of what the reform should be like. Thanks to Goodmunder, Dirk, Maxi, and Pramod. I also take the opportunity to thank my co-moderator, Marek, for putting all this together, for, uh, for getting the speakers on board, coming up with the discussion. As you said, a lot more to be discussed. We, Despite having two hours, we've run out of time, probably for another occasion. Last but not the least, I also take this opportunity to thank Mr. Gaurav Banerjee, the Vice Chairman of UNCCI, without whom this wouldn't have been possible for guiding us throughout, and perhaps a speaker for the next session on New York Convention, a domestic expert in this subject. We look forward to it. Thank you, and, look, and I invite you all to join us for our next webinar, the details of which will be provided soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.